previously on Science for All. What's a straight line? And now the answer. So a few years ago, I took a flight from Toronto in Canada to Beijing in China. Which direction do you think it went? Did it go westward or eastward? Well, actually, neither. It went northward. Yeah, that's right. You can see pictures that I took back then. And we were basically flying over the North Pole, which is pretty cool. Unfortunately, I didn't get to see Northern Lights. But why did Air Canada decide to go northward? Is it because it saved gas to fly over very cold regions? No. Air Canada just basically took the shortest path. Yeah, that's right. The shortest path from Toronto to Beijing actually goes all the way near the North Pole and then back down to Beijing. And this is very surprising and counterintuitive to us because on the Mercator map, this trajectory is not a straight line and it doesn't seem very short. But that's because the Mercator map is, as we've already said, wrong. So why do we use the Mercator map? I mean, there are maps out there like the Neumonic projection in which all shortest paths are straight lines. Well, the thing is that the Mercator's map was created in the 16th century at a time where people were traveling around the world using ships. And when you're on a ship in the middle of the ocean, the only thing that you can use to know where you are and in which direction you're going is basically the direction of the sun, the direction of the stars and compasses. In all these cases, you're using the cardinal directions, north, south, west and east. And the amazing thing about the Mercator map is that on the map, north is always up, south is always down, west is always left and east right. And because the map is also conformal, it means that the angles on the map are the same as the angles in reality in particular. The angles west, north, west is the same on the compass as it is on the map. And that was very useful. In fact, that's why the Mercator map was such an amazing breakthrough back then. Every sailor wanted this Mercator map. But let's think about this for a while. I mean, if you're shipping from Europe to America back then, you would just go westward. And thus on the Mercator map, you would follow a straight line. But we said that shortest paths are not straight lines. And in fact, this straight line is not the shortest path. So ships were not using the shortest path, but there's worse than that. They were not even going straight. I mean, if you're trying to always go westward, then you would need to always steer your boat towards the right. And that's especially true if you're close to the North Pole. I mean, in the extreme case where you basically at the North Pole, if you're always trying to go westward, you basically have to do a circle. And if you want to do a circle, you'll have to always be steering towards the right. So ships back then had to always adjust the way they were going. But wait, what does it really mean to be going straight? Many textbooks and science popularizer would tell you that to go straight, you need to minimize the distance you're going to travel. Now that's true, but I don't find it very satisfactory. I mean, we say that lights travel in straight lines, but does that mean that light is going to compute where it is, where it's going to be, and the trajectory that it needs to follow to go from where it is to where it wants to go? No, I mean, light it doesn't even know where it wants to go. Similarly, when you are on a boat, assuming that there's no wind and no currents, if you're just moving straight, well, you're just moving straight without even realizing that you're minimizing some sort of distance. So what does straight mean? Now that's a very interesting question. It's a question that before the 18th century, everybody thought they had an answer to, but the likes of Gauss, Bolyai, Lobachevsky, and most importantly, Bernard Riemann would find out to be not that 
simple. On the Earth, what happens is that if you're at a certain point and you're moving according to a certain direction, then the direction of motion will tell you where you're going to be next, but it also projects itself back on the sphere so that you know where your next direction of motion will be. So really a straight line on the Earth is a direction of motion that gets constantly projected on the Earth as it moves along. In technical terms, we say that the direction of motion undergoes a parallel transport along its motion. Now if you take that as the definition of straight lines, it leads to some very counterintuitive facts about straight lines. More specifically, if you draw two parallel lines on the surface of the Earth, like two train tracks, then even though they look very parallel right here, they will actually meet after 10,000 kilometers. And that's because straight lines on the sphere are actually the so-called great circles, these larger circles that you can do around the Earth, like the Meridians and the Equator. And these always meet at two antipodal locations. Now, in the case of the Earth, the way a direction undergoes the parallel transport is defined by the way the sphere sits within the 3D space. But the genius of Bernhard Riemann, the father of modern geometry, was to see that these parallel transports could be defined for any kind of surfaces or spaces as long as we define it intrinsically. This means that we're going to glue small pieces of surface or space together and we're going to define how a direction undergoes the parallel transport from one sheet to the neighbor sheet. Amazingly, this crucial insight would unleash the full power of geometry. This was the rise of modern geometry. This was the rise of Riemannian geometry. And it's the mathematics that underlies Einstein's theory of general relativity. Hey, so I hope you've enjoyed this video. Basically, in this video, we've discussed positively curved geometry, like the geometry of the sphere. Well, there's another kind of geometry, which is the geometry of flat spaces, like uh, the Euclidean space or the flat torus. But there's a whole other kind of geometry, and it's the geometry of my underpants. So this is a very classical underpants, uh, nothing very special. And the question I want to ask you is, what is the geometry of these underpants? And what would it be like to be living on these underpants? So what is the geometry of these underpants? So this is what I want you to think about for next time. Please, please, please share this video, show it to your friends and to other people and subscribe to this channel so that I feel like there's a, a future for this channel. Uh, you can also follow me on uh, Facebook, Twitter and Google Plus and I've put here uh, two links. Uh, one is to my Science 4 article on the theory of general relativity and the other one is a number 5 video about uh, Euclid's uh, fifth postulate which is uh, deeply connected with what I've discussed here and I hope I'll see you next time.